In terms of the function of the histone marks, as we mentioned, these are like beacons in the genome. They kind of wave their flags to tell transcription factors or polymerase where to go. And depending on the different histone marks, um, you can use this, you know, now people are using this as a tool um, to understand what genes are important, which locations are important. And, you know, in some sense, experimentally, scientists are also taking advantage of these beacons in the genome to help us understand how genes are regulated. And so um, if you look at uh, epigenetic profiles across the genome, you know, there could be some regions that have bisulfite sequencing and across the genome, you might see this type of signals. Um, if you look at H3K27 acetylation, you can see here, it's much weaker across the genome, but then in some certain regions, it's suddenly stronger. And remember, because uh, DNA methylation is normally silencing gene transcription activities. And so interestingly, in this case, when DNA methylation signal is much, much weaker, H3K27 acetylation is active or is, is stronger. K27 acetylation actually tell us which regions of the genome are really, really open and active. Whereas, um, you know, there are other marks, K4, mono and uh, uh, trimethylation that you can see, they also have signals across the genome and kind of more focal on some of these active regions. Um, so you can see here, different histone modification have a different uh, genome-wide distribution. And here is the gene annotation. And over the years, what people have learned are the following. Uh, these are some basic knowledge. Um, H3K36 trimethylation is a mark that polymerase leave as it transcribe a gene. And um, this helps polymerase to know where to start a transcription and where to slow down. For example, um, K36 trimethylation are usually stronger on the axons. Um, and um, it, it is um, a slightly lower in the introns. And also as polymerase go um, across the gene towards the later part of the gene, K36 signal is stronger. Um, this is because I'm actually suspecting that polymerase, uh, once it start transcription, it will start faster. And then as it go later in the transcription, it actually moves slightly, I suspect it's, it's actually moving slightly slower. And um, um, when there are introns, if there is any trans transcription that is a mistake, you know, from the DNA as a template to make the RNA, if there are mistakes, ah, no big deal. But when it's axon, um, polymerase need to know, okay, I need to slow down because the, the transcript actually is important for later making the, the, the protein. Therefore, the transcription is a little slower. The K36 trimethylation signal kind of indicate to pole 2 go a little slower, this region is more important. And so PO2 elongation is being guided by H3K36 trimethylation. But as polymerase go, um, polymerase recruits the methyl transferase that adds the K36 trimethylation. So initially without guidance, PO2 probably go quite slowly because it has to decide you know, where to how, you know, how fast to, to go and there's no guidance. But then with every round of transcription, PO2 will recruit the K36 trimethylation enzyme to add the marks there. Then in the next round, you will know how to move, you know, like which part to go faster, which part, part to go slower. But as it moves, it, it continues to recruit the, the methyl transferase to add marks to this to help the next round to be more smooth and, and so on. Um, H3K79 trimethylation is stronger in the first axon and the first intron, and then the later um, axons or, or gene bodies are much, much weaker. Um, H3K4 trimethylation is a very strong mark near the beginning of the gene, and it tells the cell where a gene has the promise to be activated. You can imagine this kind of is like a door that's only slightly open just to tell the cell this gene has the promise to be turned on. Um, in the enhancer regions or the transcription factor binding site, um, if 
if they are H3K4 monom isolation mark, it means that this region has the promise to be turned on, even though, or be bound by the transcription factor, even though um, that region may not be heavily bound by the transcription factor yet. Um, there, there are studies showing that um, in a lot of cells, once the lineage of the cell is determined, there are small, like low levels of the relevant transcription factors that are expressed. And very small level of these transcription factors can bind to occasional locations in the genome. Um, and and uh, they prime those enhancers to, to, to have the H3K4 monom isolation mark. So these are kind of, you know, doors only slightly open uh, just to show that these regions can potentially be turned on. But then when the outside stimulus is, is ready or when the transcription factor really turn on a lot, um, then they would go to those, you know, like slightly open locations first and then check, you know, does it have the motif and then will bind strongly. And once they bind very strongly, the histone marks will become much, much stronger. Um, and then this region will really get turned on. And then the, 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 uh, the promoters for, for those genes that have the, trimethylation mark initially they were just you know they have the promise to be turned on but then um, once the transcription factor binds to the nearby regions that really kicks off the polymerase from actively transcribing the gene and there are some marks that uh, marks both the promoters and enhancers such as um, h3k4 dimethylation and all the uh, acetylation marks actually acetylation marks in general indicate an activation you know this door is now totally open and so a region that's really bound by a lot of transcription factors on the enhancer region will have k27 acetylation mark and the promoters that's actively transcribing the gene on the promoter regions will also have very strong k27 acetylation signals and so you can see here um, the different marks really show a different thing and they also help to guide the, the transcription factors. Um, there are also repressive marks in the genome. For example, um, K27 trimethylation. Um, in, you, you can see uh, in a lot of cells that it binds to the CPG island near the promoters. This especially happened uh, during a stem cell differentiation. That actually indicates this door is kind of inaccessible, it's, it's closed. And also K, uh, H3K9 uh, trimethylation. This happens in the repeat regions of the genome, which is probably half of the genome. And in the, in the initial stage when the region needs to be silenced, it will use K9 trimethylation. But then for even longer term, you know, long-term suppression, um, you can also use DNA methylation, which is, you know, not only door is closed, you add a log to it, you know, like a big log in here, or use a board to board it up this region Then you say, okay, this region is really off limit in, in those repeats. Um, yeah, so um, even though the overall resolution uh, of histomark chip seek is slightly lower than uh, the TF chip seek, you can see here, we can already use the marks to tell us a lot about what is happening in the genome, you know, how, which regions are interesting um, and use it to understand uh, gene regulation. So uh, we mentioned here, um, very often nucleosomes, uh, the DNAs that's wrapped around the nucleosome are, uh, like preventing transcription factor from binding. Um, there are two exceptions. One is if you have multiple transcription factors that kind of form a complex and each have some DNA specificity, by working together cooperatively, they can eventually squeeze out this nucleosome and can basically kick the pearl out of the, the, the uh, necklace or the string. Um, there are also some transcription factors called pioneering factors, they sometimes even prefer to bind to these nucleosomal DNA regions. And the reason they are called pioneering factor is once they go there, they can kick out the nucleosome and they can then help additional transcription factors or other transcription factors to bind to this region. And then that will help uh, transcription of the nearby genes. Um, so you can see here um, the Again, the transcription factor uh, and epigenetics is kind of a chicken egg problem. Um, initially, when the transcription factors are expressed in the cell, 
it's quite blinding. It has to test many locations, but very often it goes to the regions that already have histone marks. Or so, so usually um, when this pioneering factor binds in here, it kicks out the nu nucleosome, but it will also recruit other histone mark readers to help mark the nearby nucleosomes. And once these nearby nucleosomes are marked better, other transcription factors will go there very, very quickly because they know there is a nucleosome free regions that can potentially be bound. And so you can see the, the histone marks on the nearby location really help, you know, like flag the locations of interest. And so this is really kind of a chicken egg problem. Epigenetics help transcription factors to find where to go first. But those transcription factors by working together or through these pioneering factors can also um, kick out nucleosomes and add more marks to the nearby nucleosome. So that actually can help understand this. Um, and so, for example, a lot of people use histone mark ChIP-seq, especially uh, H3K4 monomethylation and H3K27 acetylation ChIP-seq to identify transcription factors that are important in the cell. And so um, usually what they do is um, they do this chip seek. And in terms of analysis, the very first thing you do is you get FASTQ file uh, and uh, you can analyze it in a similar way as when you do chip seek. You do the read mapping using BWA. You can call the peaks. You can also call the differential peaks between you know, different conditions using max. You can do the standard QC to make sure this experiment actually worked. And then um, we know that um, if, if it's a K4 monomethylation or K27 acetylation chip seek, it's marking those enhancer locations. And from there, um, from uh, the recent homework, you can probably see you can do motif search in those peaks. Um, and uh, maybe that can help you at least figure out what family of transcription factors might be important in, in those uh, potential binding sites or the histone mark peaks locations. And then um, using the K27 acetylation at the read level. Um, so actually, if you look at the uh, uh, if you remember the transcription factor binding lecture, we talk about regulatory potential, which is we weigh the chip seek signals from nearby uh, regions, say within 100 kb, with an exponential decay to decide, you know, how much a binding site will have effect on the nearby gene, and um, we can do the same thing to calculate uh, regulatory potential on the K27 acetylation to calculate um, the effect on, on nearby gene. And interestingly, we, we found that using this approach, you get a pretty good idea which genes are activated and which genes are not uh, actively transcribed, which means that if on this gene, there are a lot of K27 acetylation signal, this gene is very likely to be highly transcribed. And also if there are nearby signals of K27 acetylation uh, that also, in, indicate that the there are strong transcription factors binding to the nearby regions and they help to promote the expression of this gene. And so using this approach, you can sometimes guess which genes are active. And so if they are, say, um, if there is a GATA family of transcription factors, there's GATA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they all recognize the same motif. From motif search, you might find the whole family to be potentially interesting. But then if you use the K27 acetylation to calculate this regulatory potential, you might see that, oh, in this cell, actually it's the GATA3 that's activated, but not GATA12456. And so that can help you inform on the gene expression. Um, you can also use the K27 acetylation signals in the nearby uh, transcription factor binding sites to weigh the peaks. So um, we mentioned that previously in transcription factor chip seek, whether the peak is a tenfold versus 20 fold, it probably tell you that the transcription factor is binding stronger to the region. But in terms of regulating nearby gene expression, the 20 fold peaks don't necessarily have a stronger effect on the gene expression than the tenfold peaks, uh, at least from, you know, 20 years of people modeling 
transcription factor binding. Um, there is a, a difference between the, the signal from the noise. Like if you are calling a peak with only 1.2 fold, that maybe they don't really have effect. But once the peak, you know, TF binding is at five fold, whether it's 10 fold or 20 fold or even 50 fold, um, in terms of the TF chip seek signal, it's not known to be really, you know, having a stronger effect on the gene expression nearby. Interestingly, if you look at that particular peaks, you know, TF binding location, and look at, you know, how much K27 acetylation signal is in this location, it does have an effect. For example, if you have two peaks nearby, and one peak has like 50-fold 50, 50 K27 acetylation signal, and another peak only have five-fold K27 acetylation signal, we will know that the 50-fold K27 peak, that binding site have a stronger effect on this nearby gene than the, the five-fold one. And so you can use the K27 acetylation chip seek signal, um, probably the, at the read level, you can do either a square root or a log of the K27 reads in that peak, to weigh the transcription factor um, binding um, peak and see you know, whether they have an effect on nearby genes. I think that actually usually give you better result. Um, another way you know, besides motif finding to find the relevant TF is um, you can just um, overlap the TF uh, chip seek data in the public because there are like tens of thousands of chip seek data in the public. And if you just do a peak significant overlap with your K27 acetylation chip seek or K4 monomer acetylation chip seek uh, peaks, um, and ask which public chip seek data have significant overlap with my histomark chip seek, you can actually guess which transcription factors are, are important um, for are, are important for this particular cell situation. Um, the nice thing about using a histone mark is for transcription factors, we have to know what factor is important for the cell. Uh, for example, in homework two, or sorry, homework three, uh, you see that we know that androgen receptor is important in prostate cancer. Therefore, we do an androgen receptor chip seek. But hopefully from this, you will find, oh, there are other transcription factors that might be important. But what if we don't know what transcription factor is important for, say, brain cancer? Uh, you, what you can do is you get the brain cancer tissue, um, and then you just do a, a K27 acetylation chip seek. And based on the, the peaks, and you overlap with all the known transcription factors or look at the motifs, it can tell you what transcription factor is really important for brain cancer um, without prior knowledge. And that's actually the value of doing a histone mark because it not just capture one transcription factor, it captures many, many transcription factors in this cell. And so um, using the, the Systrom toolkit, which you will see from the uh, homework, you, you will see that, um, you will see that um, using the histone marks, you can figure out what transcription factors are important. And you can also use differential peaks to do this overlap. Um, and so this kind of utilize a Systrom database, which collects a lot of chip seek data uh, from published studies. Uh, this is another example um, of one of our earlier studies. Um, so as we mentioned in here, um, depending on how you do the chip seek, if you do sonication, the fragments are usually longer. You will probably get, you know, a fragment that cover, you know, two to three nucleosome at a time. And so overall, you will see a broad peak. Maybe the middle is slightly lower, uh, but overall, you will see kind of a strong peak. Um, but if you use sonication to get a mononucleosome and then sequence, what you will see is that there, there is one peak in here, there's another peak in here, and the middle will be actually kind of lower signal, and you can actually get a good resolution of the signals. And so this is one example of a study where um, we look at the um, K, K27 acetylation or K4 dimethylation of um, small intestine. So uh, in small intestine, 
the crypts here at the cells at the bottom of the, the small intestine, they have the stem cells and can they, they, they continue to grow new cells or uh, uh, proliferate. But then the differentiated cells will be pushed to the top of the villi. Um, and these cells you know, grow, uh, they differentiate and they have more absorption. So the food is kind of in, in, in here and the, these cells absorb the nutrient into um, inside the, the villi and to be transferred to the blood to the rest of your body. And so you can see here the, the yellow kind of progenitor cells are more stem cell like and the, the cells on the top are more differentiated cells. And in the weak time, these cells, you know, these are younger and they become older and older. The older cells eventually in the weeks time will be shed into the intestine and they will die. And so um, from the, you know, if you get the small intestine from, from mice and you just shake them, uh, the, the villi will be shaked off from the crypt and you can do epigenetic profiles of the uh, of these two cell types separately. And, um, and what, what, what you can see across the genome, there are a lot of locations that the epigenetic signals are very similar between the progenitor cells and differentiated cells. They just say, oh, this is intestine. But then there are some locations like this. In the progenitor cells, you might see two well-positioned nucleosomes. And in the middle, there's a nucleosome missing. Whereas in the differentiated cells, they're all kind of weak, you know, three weakly uh, uh, marked at, uh, nucleosomes. And you can imagine this is kind of the priming, very low level of transcription expressed just to mark some enhancers as potentially interesting, but they are not really active. But then during, uh, um, actually in this case, it's after the, the, the transcription factor is, is no longer active. Um, this region will, will kind of have a much weaker mark. But in the progenitor cells, when the transcription factor is really, really active, it binds to the middle and recruits the histomark writers to write stronger marks to the nearby region. So they raise very strong flags to recruit other transcription factors to bind to this location. And so you can imagine there's like a bunny ear in here and the middle is where the transcription factor really binds. And if we can identify those locations, Again, you can imagine this as a big peak, and this is not a peak, right? Or you can imagine it's like a bunny ear with a trough in the middle, and this actually gives us good resolution to look for motifs. And from this, we can see which transcription factors are really important for the progenitor cell. And um, in comparison, there are regions in the progenitor cell that are kind of poised, you know, ready or, or potentially can be bound, but then in the differentiated cell, when the transcription factor really become active. They bind to some regions like this and the middle will be much, much lower. And you can look for motifs or, or do the, you know, the chip seek overlap. We can also see that, oh, there's a, another group of transcription factors that are, are, are bind to this location. And sometimes you might also see uh, like this transcription factor. Um, it, it can bind to different locations even though it's the tr same transcription factor, sometimes it uniquely binds to some regions in the progenitor, but um, in, in the differentiated cells, it uniquely binds to some other location. This is because the same transcription factor uh, are cooperating with different other transcription factors. Um, so in this case, for example, in the progenitor cells, the CDX transcription factor is working together with GATA. And these two together, yeah, they both work as kind of a pioneering factors and the, the two together can squeeze out, you know, some nucleosomes. And then in the differentiated cells, CDX2 is interacting with HNF4A, it's another pioneering factor. And because of the motif location, in other locations, these two are, are together and they can squeeze out different uh, other nucleosomes. And then they recruit other transcription factors. And then you can see actually, they regulate very different genes. In the progenitor cells, it really regulates proliferation. Whereas uh, in the, the differentiated cells, by collaborating with different transcription factors, it regulates a lot of the absorption, you know, nutrient, uh, related to the, the, the gene functions. Okay, so this is how you can use uh, H3K4 model dye methylation or K27 acetylation chip C to help you figure out 
what transcription factors are important, what transcription factors are binding in this location, and what kind of nearby genes they regulate. Okay, um, let's see.